And by the age of nine or so, I was actually recruited. 1930, no later than 1931, I was actually recruited in the children's organization of the uh, Communist Party, the Young Pioneers of America. And went through that in one of the most hectic periods of American communism. That period was one of continual insurgency. The Communist Party and the Communist International, despite the fact that Stalin was coming to power, and his power wasn't absolutely assured as yet, was not to be assured until five or six years later with the Moscow trials when he killed off all the old Bolsheviks. But before that period, between, say, 1930 or 31 and 1935, the United States, the Communist Party and the Communist movement generally in the United States was in its most insurrectionary phase. We'd go from one demonstration to another demonstration and fight the police in New York City. And with the Depression, we had great hunger marches. Thousands would rally in various parts of New York and march towards City Hall, New York City Hall, with bread banners and slogans like, we want bread, <laughs> not war, or we want butter, not guns. Slogans that you could have heard in 1848 or in 1789 in the French Revolution. In other words, it was easier for us in those days to communicate more comfortably with someone who had been on the June barricades in Paris, workers who had been on the June barricades in Paris under the red flags of 1848, and it would have been to talk to someone today, <laughs> or even to, you know, contemporaries or people younger, a generation later than my own, or two generations later than my own, who were to make up the new left. So that old left that everybody talks about had some very limiting, limiting features about it, but it also had enormously expansive features about it. It had a rich musical heritage. It, had, it felt it was really completing the French Revolution of 1789 to 1794. And we all modeled ourselves, even the Bolsheviks in Russia modeled ourselves on the French Revolution, the whole cycle of the revolution. We thought in terms of a class struggle of the working class, the proletariat, industrial proletariat, which was very numerous at that point in the United States. In the 1920s, the assembly line had come in. We didn't have that before, not quite in the form that Henry Ford produced. And workers and unions and everything like that and workers' parties, the word worker, proletarian, was on everybody's lips. So it was a period in which we had a very coherent analysis of the working class taking power, establishing a proletarian dictatorship, which we thought would be more democratic, in fact, than the American Bill of Rights, for example, because now the people would control the press, not the uh, oligarchical few capitalists. And we saw workers in action. They were really doing revolutionary things, so it seemed to us. It's not only that they were going out on strike, it's not only that workers were very deeply class conscious, an amazing phenomenon that people have forgotten about today. <laughs> workers knew that they were workers. They called themselves labor. They called themselves workers, and in the most radical cases, they called themselves proletarians, and that would not have been alien to most workers in industry, mines, uh, in many cases even craft-type workers. We used to have cigar workers working right out in the open uh, in little cigar stores wrapping leaves of tobacco. We had craftsmen all over. We didn't have, incidentally, the giant supermarkets and the uh, corporate type of retail outlets that we have today. In those days, everything was a mom-and-pop store. And you knew everyone in the neighborhood. We also had open-air meetings soapbox meetings, as they used to be called, where regularly, almost every day of the week, if the weather was reasonably clement, somebody would be on a stand talking about revolutionary ideas and talking about all kinds of class issues, dealing with class struggle, with socialism, with communism. And unfortunately, at that point, we didn't have very much anarchism around. The anarchist movement had more or less been overshadowed by the communists and the socialists. 
remember well that in 1932, in the depths of the Depression, Norman Thomas, the socialist candidate for president, got more votes, almost a million votes, than Eugene V. Debs did in 1912, which was regarded as the heyday of American socialism, and that the communists got another 160 or 170,000 so you see, these were big, sizable movements that were very much in the public eye, however small the membership was. And also, finally, in the 1930s, it seemed like everything was going to be fulfilled. All our dreams as Marxists and as revolutionaries were going to be fulfilled. Terrible as the Depression was for so many people in the United States, for us it was something different that had meaning. The Depression, despite the economic deprivation every one of us saw, felt very personally, and I saw my furniture in the house out on the street every three months because of rental evictions, which was a standard routine during the Depression. At times you'd see a whole block covered, you know, the sidewalks covered with the furniture of people who were being evicted from their apartments for non-payment of rent. And I knew what it meant to go hungry, even for several days. The point, point is that despite this kind of material deprivation that many of us radicals in those days felt, particularly communists and socialists, and I guess anarchists, uh, we still felt exhilarated.